Welcome to On Texas Football. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Rod Babers. This is Second Watch with Rod Babers, the former Longhorn Letterman uh, NFL player. Uh, he always, uh, on Sundays for us, takes a second look at the game film, re-watches what he saw on uh, Saturday, and then uh, we talk about it here. Uh, Rod today has outlined four different things he wants to talk about. Uh, and so, Rod, without further ado, let's start with uh, your first topic was, quote, empowering Arch Manning. What, do you, what did you mean by that, buddy? Uh, yeah, I mean, going into that game, I thought, you know, there'd be certain modifications uh, to the offense because of Arch Manning and his inexperience making his second start. But I think uh, Sark expected an exponential leap of improvement from start one to start two for Arch. And I think the number one indicator of that is the early game, early down pass rate. I mean, he was upwards of how probably over 70%. Uh, early game, early down pass rate. Um, even this, the, the the opening script, you could see it was about getting him into a rhythm, getting getting Arch into a groove. I mean, I would say maybe eight of the first ten plays either involved play action pass, RPO, or some kind of screen. <laughs> and I think that was all to make sure that it was as as Arch friendly as possible. And uh, it, I mean, and obviously he thrived. He looked great. And one of the things I thought it was also another indicator that he's starting to trust Arch a lot more was the pre-snap motion. I mean, you got up to close to your average, which is Sark is around 55%. Uh, between 50 55%, you were right there in your average. So another week of practice, I'm sure he got a lot more reps and Sark started to trust him more with some of the details, right? That was the very, you know, meticulous details, those cheat codes that Sark loves so much in the offense. So the, the, the pre-snap motion, I thought that was another indicator of the trust he had in empowering uh, young Arch Manning. And I thought, you know, overall, you know, the, the deep balls, we talked about it, you know, was he going to throw more of those deep balls? A lot of the deep balls were schemed specific, right? They were schemed open, what basically. Is, what do you mean by that? Well, they were the, – the, 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 uh, there, there were four of them, basically, uh, the entire game. So you had the – you had the deep shot to early on. There was a play action pass to Golden. Uh, sorry, Matthew Golden. That's that was one. You had the stock block and go. So that's primary specific to DeAndre Moore. Same concept that Ryan Wingo scored on versus ULM down in the red zone. Stock block and go. That's scheme specific to a certain guy. We're going to him. He's our primary target. Um, even the the John Tay Cook throw, which is the only actually deep ball that he missed. And he didn't miss it. It was a drop. Uh, that was a target to motion. You know, I'm a big fan. Love me some targets to motion. Uh, that was a target to motion. Usually a target to motion where they motioned him to be the number three receiver, I believe, in that situation. They were it was a kind of a primary target thing. Like he was your so number they, one. Target. When you say that, when you say that, you're saying Sark essentially says, Arch, go here with the ball if you can. I'm a I'm a scheme this guy open for you. And actually, yeah. uh DeAndre Moore, his 27-yard touchdown, which we'll get into him too. That was a, a target to motion. Um, he motions over from uh, the, I think, the short side to the wide side into what I call it a trident. It's like a triangle trips formation there. And then and go look at Arch. It seems like he's the primary two the whole time. <laughs> looking for him to clear that that safety, uh, that down safety, looking for him to clear that safety uh, over the top because it was single high at the time. So I, I think that I think he wanted to make sure he's kind of schemed open some of those those deep shots for him because I, I think they want to incorporate that because I think preference wise we know I think the uh, time to throw for Arch in that game was two point eight seconds. He was holding on to the ball a little bit because he wants to go. He he naturally likes to get deeper into progressions and I think he wants to take a little bit more shots early on than even Quinn does because he naturally just has a beautiful deep ball and that's one of the strengths of his game and I think Sark wants to cultivate that. So you didn't see ten like you saw. <laughs> in uh, the ULM start, but you saw four and they were very calculated, very, you know, scheme specific shots down the field. I, I love how you explain that because essentially instead of just letting the, the, the red shirt freshman go at it. Right. Yep. Um, and Hey, read what you can and go eat. Right. He's actually giving him specific plays, which is, is more tactical from Sark maybe also uh, yep. trying to, to now getting him into a, uh, it, involved more uh, straightforward in the in the scheme because Sark does scheme a lot of plays open not just for Arch but also he does it a lot for Quinn as well and it's part of his offense uh it's uh it's interesting that you're talking about that the other thing that I had here uh and and you talked about 
empowering Arch. It clearly worked. Um, yeah. His uh, <laughs> game one to game two numbers going from 15 for uh, 29 to 26 Great. and 31. Yep. 324, three TD or two TDs, one rushing uh, as well. What did you think of Arch's performance? Was there anything you saw that kind of wowed you? Was there anything you saw that said, wait a minute, I didn't like that so much? Or was it, it Ooh. felt, I don't, I don't want to use the term flawless, but it felt pretty darn good. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't, I did not see a lot to critique in that performance. He really, I mean, that was just, it really was. You can tell that he's a prodigy. That's what happens with prodigies. They're, you know, their developmental rates a lot quicker than everybody else's. So I, I expected improvement from start one to start two. I don't know if I expected him to look that sharp. Uh, and there were some things that, you know, he identified in that game that, um, that ULM presented to him that he was able to solve quickly. Uh, matter of fact, the DeAndre Moore touchdown, and we'll talk DeAndre Moore because I'm bringing him up a lot. Uh, yeah. DeAndre Moore touchdown um, that they ran out of empty formation. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, they, they bring a DB blitz there. Um, they bring a DB blitz there, and he identifies it. He knows he's going to get hit, identifies it quickly, but knows exactly where he's going with the football. Pre-snap, you can tell he diagnosed it. All right, this is my matchup that I like. As long as he clears it, I'm, 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 I'm letting it go. And he did not have – there was no indecision. And there was a uh, that DB blitz in that ULM game. I forgot exactly what time of the, the game it was, but you can tell it surprised him. He didn't see it coming. He's like, oh, man, pre-snap, he just didn't see it. And but in this in this game, I think he was able to recognize it. So just that was just little moments like that. And Brian talked about that actually on our on our post game. And I went back and rewatched it and saw it too. There's these little moments uh, where you can tell the maturity and you can tell you can see the growth from um, Arch and his instincts are still great. I mean, you can tell that when he runs. And that was also about when he ran that he showed it was this very this moment of just a being a savvy scrambler as well, where. You know, if you commit to just scrambling right away, defenders, we react. We act, oh, are you running? You head down, you're not even looking up, you're just running, you got the ball tucked. All right, I'm, I can take a beeline to you and I can try to cut you off, right? Um, but he knows as a quarterback, he's got one huge advantage that I don't tuck the ball right away. And if I keep my eyes up, you've got to respect that as a defender. And he did that on that long scramble. Go watch him when he first gets out there. And it's weird looking too, because he's he's got his head up, and you're like, why is he it's like he's jogging? It, it yeah. Was almost- <laughs> yeah. And it's like, why, why is he not running? Is he's in danger? But I think it was him trying to being savvy enough to know if I keep my eyes up long enough, I will, I will hold these defenders. I will hold a few of them and I'll get the extra yards I need. It's that's, that's instincts right there. I mean, also, you know, it's him knowing the quarterback position, but that was a savvy moment right there. It's him as a scrambling quarterback. So there were just these little moments, but there's no doubt. He was, he was spectacular. He was, I mean, one, he had five incompletions. One of them was a drop. It should have it should have been you know a, a touchdown another touchdown resume yeah seventy yard touchdown yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm looking at it and and we'll go to we're, we're going to go next to another thing that Rod wanted to bring up but I was looking at it and I, I was thinking about it this morning uh, in post game uh, or th- this morning and twenty six of thirty one for three twenty four and two TDs there are Texas quarterbacks starting Texas quarterbacks that have never done that <laughs> and never have that good a game. And he did it in his second start. So, I mean, yeah. right yeah. in the first year SEC game. That, yeah. That's pretty <laughs> cool. I mean, yeah. so uh, it's yeah. hard to quantify or qualify what it actually was. Agreed. But uh, it's pretty special. All right. The, the next thing you had for us, that's a good, good breakdown there of Arch and, and Sark empowering him and, and then his response to it, Rod. Now, you wrote down more involved, M-O-O-R-E, as in DeAndre <laughs> Moore. Involved. Yeah. What did you mean there? Because he finished with uh, what four for a hundred, a hundred and change, yep. two touchdowns. Uh, you you felt like Sark was going to try to go at De- DeAndre a little bit this week. Yeah, because I'm looking at those four targets, right? They uh, first of all, the stock block and go. That four, that that target right there tells you that's a, like I said, scheme specific. He schemed him open last uh, two weeks ago against ULM. That was. Uh, Dwayne Wingo, they got schemed over for that one. You got to play the role that you're going to block and go watch Arch. He gives the pump fake to the screen there. They think it's going to be a swing screen, and then he knows exactly where his primary is, and that was DeAndre Moore. And he caught it beautiful. Probably should have been a touchdown, but uh, ended up being just a big uh, explosive play for it. And then there is – there was another target, actually, a seven-yard target, I believe. Um, He had a seven-yard target earlier in the game. That also was a target to motion. 
So that was a target to motion as well. So, you know, I, I, I'm big on those are specific primaries for the, the, the quarterback, usually when he's targeting a player that was in motion prior to the snap at the time of the snap. Uh, his 27-yard touchdown was a target to motion where he target it comes from the short side to the wide side into that triangle bunch formation. I like to call it kind of a trident and he knows exactly where he's going with the football. Go look at Arch's eyes. <laughs> uh, he's not re he's reading that safety. He's reading that, that safety. And when that safety commits or over commits to those underneath that mesh concept, those underneath crossing routes, that's when Arch knows, okay, I definitely got him. Now, do I have it for a touchdown? Do I need to throw it? you know, closer to the sideline and let my receiver come, you know, back to the football or can I throw it over the top? And he has a chance to to, to get an explosive play over the top because that there's a single high safety that he's also reading. The single high safety doesn't have great leverage and that underneath safety over commits, which both happen, boom, money, touchdown. And that, But it was a target to motion in that one. And then there is also uh, the, the, the the other touchdown, the, the, uh, the 49-yard uh, touchdown where he is, and I, I don't know this was as you know pri as a primary, but I do believe Art sees the matchup he likes pre-snap. Once he motions Jaden Blue out to empty formation, you guys know I love empty, and um, and then he recognizes, oh, I got Denzel Moore in the slot. Go look at him. Gunnar Helms on the outside at number one to that side, and he runs. It's a smash concept. He runs just a a quick hitch route, and you can see they got Denzel Moore running that slot fade. And I believe that that was his primary on that one because he lets it loose and he knows I got a matchup I like there. And he's going to have the hole outside on that slot fade. That's where you throw it. You got that hole outside because Gunnar Helm clears, clears it with the, the the hitch route. So you can throw it all with that outside shoulder and you got plenty of room to deliver the football. And it was a beautiful throw. So, it, you know, I'm not saying I, I don't know if that one was so three out of the four. I know were pretty much primary, you know, primary specific throws to that target. But that one I'm not too sure about. But I do believe in that spot he was the guy that Arch recognized had the matchup advantage that he wanted. Interesting. And that, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, that's a third down, isn't it? Yeah, that was a third down. That that third uh, down. Long touchdown pass. Yeah, yeah that was a third long down. So down. you know, third down. You as a quarterback, you're like, all right, this is the guy. These are the guys I'm looking for. He's going to be my primaries here. I think DeAndre Moore is that guy. So I think I think they wanted to get more going, and that was the best game he's had and so far. My prediction. Remember, I said half the games, you're going to have a different leading receiver for at least half the games. So we have four. We got four <laughs> lead, different leading receivers already within the first like five games. Uh, I, I think it's impressive just how many they are. Uh, it, it gives a, a feel uh, for really what Sark's trying to do. Uh, Isaiah Bond had five for 74. Matthew Golden, five for 52. Uh, Bond also had that reverse for a touchdown. Uh, oh. Sark finds a way to get the guys the ball. He just does. Uh, and whether that's a, a quarterback distributing it or play call, like you mentioned, scheme specific earlier, it's interesting that Moore was the guy that he chose to do that this week with, uh, you yep. know, because he's, he's maybe he's just got going through his playbook to put as much on film as possible. So ultimately, everybody has to defend everything. Is that kind exactly. of the thought process? That's what it, you just hit the nail on the head, Bobby. That's what it is. That's the brilliance of it. It's like, no, no. Every week as a defensive coordinator, you got to go in there. You're just you're, – you're up late nights stressing out, trying to figure out who do I take away? Like, who who do I take away now? I mean, you can take away Golden, Bond. Now you got to worry about DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo. Uh, thank God he's, you know, not hurt because well, he came yeah, yeah. in the game. Um, hell, Gunnar Helm has been your leading receiver at one time. I think – I think that's what it's about. I think he's he's just trying to keep defensive coordinators on their toes, and it is a nightmare scenario trying to game plan against his offense <laughs> with all those well, weapons. I think Texas fans say more of, more of it. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> that would be good. Uh, hey, you, you also wrote something here um, that you wanted to go over, and it was the fact that you thought Texas emphasized the screen game but when a lot of people think of the screen game, it's not the typical, uh, you know, throw it to the running back. Uh, and uh, watch them go a little bit. This is more the uh, mm -hmm. horizontal screen game, yeah, I guess yeah. is the way to put it, whether it's, you know, bubbles. I mean, whatever you want to call the terminology these days, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, I just remember Sark saying last week that he wanted to pump up the, sprint, the, 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 the screen game. He was like, yeah, we got to get more of a, out of our screen game. And I remember him saying it, and it stood out to me because I thought to myself, 
interesting because I, I, I didn't think they did a good job of it in that ULM game. I was like, yeah, his screen package is as sophisticated and as, you know, lethal <laughs> as any screen game other than like Andy Reid's screen game in the NFL. So it's got a really cool screen game. I mean, coaches all over football copy his screen, his screen uh, play designs. Yeah, they and call it the start that that throwback. They call it the yeah. start screen now. The throwback yeah. the running back that Jonathan Brooks always executed so well. Is that right? Yeah. It's like made its way around, like up trickled up to the NFL and, and other areas of, of college football. And so he's real well respected for a lot of things, but of course his screen game. And when he said that, I thought to myself, I think you're going to see a lot more because they need a way to supplement the run game. Now the run game at the end of that game versus Mississippi State second half, they, they finally started to impose their will, but Texas run game, you know, it, it's it struggles to be consistent. I think to, to have that consistency in the run game. But I love what, what Trey Wiseman did, and you got the injuries, right? So you need a way to supplement the run game because you don't have, really have a workhorse. I don't even know if you can afford to 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 make one running back a workhorse consistently without it coming back to bite you injury wise. So I think you got to find ways to supplement the run game, and the screen game is the perfect way to do it. Essentially, it's just a long handoff, and based on Pro Football Focus, I think they, Texas had nine screens. Uh, in this game, that's a lot of screens. <laughs> that's a lot of, based on the Pro Football Focus number. So that's a lot of screens, and I think that ultimately that's your bubble screens and your tunnel screen. You know, the tight end screen came back. We had it wasn't successful, but we starting to see the tight end screen come back. And I think that those bubbling tunnels. Listen, hell, Bunce scored on one. I believe they got called back. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. Guys, that can be a real nice extension of the running game. And I think Sark understands that that's why you're going to – I think that that number nine, it may be high this week because maybe they saw something matchup-wise or he wanted oh, – he want, you'll get what you emphasize. He overemphasized it this week because of what he uh, kind of said to the media. But I think with, going forward, considering the state of the running back room and considering, you know, the, the level of the running back – really the running game period for Texas when Arch is not in there because he boosts the hell out of the running game with what he does – um, I think you got to supplement it with more screen game and not just the traditional screens, but the wide receiver screens and the tight end screen game too. And I'll throw this out there. The, the wide receiver run game, they don't, they don't do it a lot. They scored on it again. I said last week, I said, they should, they should do more wide receiver ending the rounds because they're great at those in the rounds. They're fantastic. They've got, I think four on the season now, 55 yards, 25 yards, 26 yarder is scored on, and you got one negative. I think that was Silas Bowden. and he got like a, a minus, like minus eight yards or something on one. But it's worth it. I think you should do one a game. I, I'm serious. I think you would be there. Remember, even old school, Greg, back, back in the day, hell, Greg Davis and like Major Applewhite were doing this. When they had Marquise Goodwin, he just got inducted to the Hall of Honor. Shout out. Go look at how many rushes he's got in his career. He got like 45 because he was basically was so fast. All we got to do is give him a sliver of daylight. And if we can get him going downhill with that kind of speed, basically turn it into a kickoff return for him. Oh man, it's it, it, it you know it's it's all types of hell that for defensive uh, defensive backs like myself and DBs to try to tackle that guy in open field and to to diagnose the right angle to the football, which a guy like Bond destroys. So more ending arounds, more screen game, and you saw it in this game. I think you'll see it more going forward. I, I, Isaiah Bond's a good runner, by the way. He is. Um, he's a good runner on the outside, even after the catch. I mean, and he's yeah. not necessarily making a lot of – he makes no. subtle moves that make people miss. But, boy, he sees it and he accelerates. That, wow. that's, uh, that's, that's one of the things I like. So, uh, look, all of those things, uh, Texas uh, ends up scoring 35. They left more than that on the field with a couple yep. of fumbles, uh, with the drop TD pass. Uh, I, I, you know, clearly Mississippi State is not all that on defense. No, uh, they've been torched by many teams that this year already. Uh, but uh, a good performance overall. Let's let's flip to the defense. And what you wanted to talk about the defense was yet another style approach that you saw from Johnny Nansen that is different than what you've seen previously. Um, and it, it had mixed success as the defense did all day, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, still held a team to just 13 points. But what did you see, Rod, that you want to point out to, to folks and let them know that Texas is now adding to its bag of tricks, so to speak? 
Yeah, it seemed like on third downs, I saw a lot of uh, Texas mugging with their linebackers and then something, the edges as well. Now, we've seen them with the linebackers mug the B-gap before. Uh, mugging the B-gap basically is when you bring a linebacker right down to the line of scrimmage. He's in a two-point stance, and he's showing blitz or showing that he's going to basically take that gap. Um, but it, it could end up dropping back in coverage, could end up you know, rushing. You could do a number of different things with it. So Texas does it with his linebackers, and I've seen that before. Um, but I've, seen, I've never seen them do it with their edge rushers as much. And I saw Trey Moore doing it on third down. I saw Colin Simmons doing it on third down. Anthony Hill, I believe Anthony Hill's sack, actually, he's mugging the B-gap at the time when he gets that sack. So I believe they thought for some reason either they can confuse the blocking schemes of Mississippi State that way because um, sometimes guys would drop back in coverage, sometimes the guys would come, and sometimes they would be a spot. Sometimes they'd kind of sit there and then they're just watching the quarterback because the quarterback run game scrambles was hurting Texas a little bit. Uh, so they did a lot of different things with it. And usually you saw it on third down and that kind of fits and tracks Johnny Nansen's MO. He's always got a little something, you know, a little something extra. He's going to throw on there on third down. Third down is when right now Brian Flores is one of the most creative defensive coordinators in the NFL right now. People keep talking about the Vikings defense and how what a nightmare it is to go up against. But it's really a nightmare only on third downs. It's when he gets really exotic and freaky and crazy and believes he's got, you know, more freedom as a defensive coordinator to, to work with different concepts and more creative concepts. And I think Johnny Nansen's like that too. That's what we see your NASCAR pad. Matter of fact, you saw that the NASCAR came back, the NASCAR dime, and you only saw it at the end of the half or the end of the game when they knew Mississippi State was in a pass situation. Because Mississippi State ran the ball so much, you couldn't take the chance of throwing out a NASCAR dime out there. But you saw it later. Matter of fact, half your sacks came out of that NASCAR dime. And that's where you can really feature uh, Colin Simmons coming off the edge. You can isolate him a little bit uh, coming off the edge. But it's just some of the creative things that I'm seeing from Johnny Nansen, they seem to usually come on, on third downs is when you see him get a lot more uh, exotic. Uh, with some of those looks. And so I you say usually when you get something from Johnny Nansen, it, you, you see it again. It's not something that's only matchup specific to that week. He usually puts it in his catalog. And if another team presents that those those problems or another team has a similar DNA, you'll 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 see that that concept again. And I expect to see it again too, where if they want to expose somebody's guards or trying to manipulate the blocking scheme offensively, you'll start mugging those guys in that in that gap. And maybe even sometimes, because like I said they would rush a lot of the times too, just get them matched up on a less athletic interior offensive lineman and see if you can just beat them with speed and quickness and twitchiness. And that happened a couple of times. Maybe just confuse a young quarterback too, right? Also, I mean, that, that, that could be one of them. I, I, yeah. I've got to, I've got to ask you this. Um, the run defense for Texas on uh, Saturday was – it wasn't horrible, but it was less than ideal, I guess is the way to put it, right? The 50 attempts for 150, so they averaged three uh, yards a carry, which doesn't sound a lot like a lot, but they were fairly efficient runs. They weren't behind the chains very often at all, Mississippi State. That maybe is the point of, of just about anything that you talk about Mississippi State on Saturday – they didn't feel like they were behind the chains unless they had penalties themselves. Uh, there, you know, it just didn't feel that way. My my question to you is: Were you worried in retrospect about the Texas run defense in, on on your second watch? Um, I do think you will have teams that will try to replicate that model in some way. Because this is the thing we we said before the season: Texas was going to be susceptible to the power run game. Yep. All right. We now we didn't know what Lole and Bill Norton and Tia Severe were going to bring. We didn't know if Alfred Collins and Vernon Brown were going to step up, which, by the way, they have. And I, I see Severe, Norton and, you know, Lole, those guys have played really well. So I, I think they've obviously one of the best defense in the country. They've exceeded expectations in that regard. But they they this is a very unique beast in Jeff Levy's offense that Beer and shoot. And I think they were able to basically implement some some power run concepts against Texas, and they never broke. They, they broke one every now and then, but for the most part, they were able to control the game that way. Early yes. on, yeah, right. They forced Texas to play their style of game, and that's that's the concern because Michigan had a power run game, but Michigan didn't have that much success running the football. But they're not the unique beast that you know Jeff Levy's veer and shoot is, where they have the wide splits of the 
of the wide of the wide receivers outside uh, where they run a lot of pace and tempo. And also, I'll just say it, you know, SEC athletes, I said it out in the post game, right? SEC athletes are different. They are. They are. I mean, they're twitchier. They're still faster. You know, they got they, they're stronger. They're, they're more explosive. And I think, even you know, I'm not saying that, you know, Michigan doesn't have some of those guys, but SEC teams seem to have a lot more <laughs> of those types of players. And I think ultimately, you know, that just gave Texas some problems. Um, so who can present that and who will try to replicate that? Power run game, but it ain't just a power run game. You gotta you gotta stress Texas in, in other ways. So Oklahoma, which has some similar DNA offensively, they will probably try that. Right? They they got a quarterback that can move. They you know they got some deer and shoot principles. Now I don't know how many wideouts are going to be healthy for them. It's no discussion. I don't know if you got to respect their alignment or not, but they'll do that and. I don't, I don't know if they got good running back, but they'll try to replicate that and run downhill, run on talking about power gap concepts. And that's what they did. And Brian uh, brought it up on our post game, you know, all- reallocating resources on the old lines, pulling a tackle, pulling a guard. And, and so you can win the numbers advantage on the other side. You know, they did a lot of that too. So it, it was a, it was a really good game plan by Jeff Levy. You got to give him some credit. He kept that game competitive for three quarters. And I have no idea how he did it. Texas was their own worst enemy. Self-inflicted wounds with penalties and turnovers. And I think that's the wake-up call for Texas. You are really good. Good enough to be ranked the number one team in the country. But in the SEC, just if you have an off week, you know, where penalties and turnovers and, and you're making critical mistakes in crucial moments, you can lose. You gotta you keep your mind. You gotta you know it. Just ask Ole Miss. You gotta keep your mind right. You know, it Texas is, man. down to number two, Alabama now number one, by the way. Uh, they had a great game uh, oh. against George last night. That was a, that was a farm a burn. Game. It was fun to watch. Hey, I, I got to say this uh, about Jeff Levy, and uh, this is probably my – I'm going to add something to the Rod Babers' uh, second watch here. Um, right. You know, this game, other than uh, – so the very first possession, Mississippi State came out. They they went essentially a three and out. Texas forced a fourth down, and Jeff Levy went for it, I think, on his own 34. Yeah, <laughs> on fourth and one, uh, and yeah. he made it. And then they made a couple more turn, a uh, couple more first downs to kind of roll about seven and a half minutes off the clock. Okay, well Texas then immediately took the ball back and scored. Went up seven nothing. Very first uh, possession of the game. Next possession for Mississippi State. Texas forces a three and out. Right. Texas forced a three and out. Oh, uh, Mississippi State punted. Texas is moving the ball, and that's when the Jaden Blue fumble occurred yeah. in the red zone. So Texas had a chance in the very first two possessions to put Mississippi State more on its heels, and they they, they had the foot on the throat, and they, they took it off when they fumbled. Mm-hmm. And then one uh, or two uh, additional possessions, and Texas doesn't score for whatever reason, and it's a different-looking ball game at half. Yep. Um, and so when I'm thinking about this, Rod, and, uh, I, it's the incremental things, the small things that can add up to bigger. And Texas not taking advantage, not having that killer instinct yesterday, and some sloppy play, maybe lazy, lack of urgency, that all added up to a 35-13 win. It's hard to believe that we're belaboring a 22-point win, by the way. Uh, Texas would have taken any win four years ago. So my, my, my point being – Texas was really close to blowing this open. I think everybody sees that. But to your point, you said it was mental. You know, you got to get your mind right every week. Yep. I, I agree with you. All right. All right. That's going to do it uh, for this week's rewatch, our second watch, excuse me, with Rod Babers. Thanks, Rod, for your expertise. Uh, again, uh, em- empowering Arch, uh, more involved, emphasizing the screen game. And then how Texas changed it up its look looks a little bit on the defensive yep. uh, front. That's all things Rod Babers came up with for you guys. Uh, we'll see you a little bit later today. We have the live stream at seven o'clock tonight. For Rod Babers, I'm Bobby Burton. Welcome. Welcome.